welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about something that's really special to me. It's the highlight in my photography career up to this moment and maybe even my life. It left such a big impression on me that I even wrote a book about it, which I will talk about later in this video. Last year, a volcanic eruption took place on the Reykjanes Peninsula, just outside of Reykjavik. And it's always been a childhood dream of mine to photograph and see an eruption like this. And this was fueled by watching many nature documentaries on the BBC and National Geographic. And it felt really unique to see volcanoes erupt because it kind of looks like you're looking back in the past. And especially when you realize that you're watching the new landscape being created in front of your eyes, this is something that has always struck a chord with me. When this eruption started, it was kind of a dream scenario to me because it was an easy to access eruption. It was quite safe, except for the gas emissions, which you need to be careful about. And it was really close to my house. And this meant that I could go many, many times. I went in total about 44 times, of which once with a helicopter and 43 times on foot. So I really took my time to document and see this volcanic eruption. And today I want to share with you my uh, five most important moments and most important photography experiences uh, that I had during this time documenting the eruption. The first thing I want to talk about is the very first day, which will probably not surprise anyone because the very first day was also the very first moment that I actually got to experience and see an eruption. But before I can do that, I have to explain what the lead up was to this eruption. So about six weeks before the eruption actually kicked off, we had a lot of earthquake activity that started on the Reykjanes Peninsula. And this meant that almost on a daily basis, we had several earthquakes that we could feel here in Reykjavik. It was a very unsettling time. But about a week before the eruption started, it looked like all the activity had died down. We had a really big earthquake and then the activity died down. There was no other, just a little bit of small earthquakes that followed after. And this led everyone to believe, and me included, that the eruption was not going to happen. So on the day the eruption started, I actually drove out of town after work and I drove to Snifersness with two friends. We were going to spend the weekend there to photograph waterfalls and just explore the area. And when we were setting up our stuff in front of Kirkefettl, a really famous mountain there, we got a text saying, hey, look, an eruption has begun on Reykjanes. And we were all kind of caught by surprise. So the first thing we then decided was, what are we going to do? So we took our stuff, put it back in the car, drove to the guest house, left a message for the people who were thinking that we were going to stay there for two nights and uh, drove back to Reykjavik. And we started out driving around the area where the eruption was and we couldn't really see anything other than a really uh, big red glow in the mountains. And afterwards we, all, we realized that the eruption had actually started in a valley, so we couldn't have seen anything uh, that evening. But it was kind of crazy because obviously we were not the only ones there. And there were hundreds of people driving around the area trying to figure out how they could see the eruption. And some people even started climbing up mountains in their sneakers and without lights. Everybody was just so excited about this. And the day after, I kind of waited until the authority said, uh, look, we don't recommend you going, but if you go, then you just leave your car there and start hiking in that direction. And that's what I did. I drove to a parking lot close to the Blue Lagoon. And from there, I started a four hour hike in one direction. And this hike was not easy. This hike went over uh, a very rugged lava field and it went up and down about three hours. After that, you got to the slopes of Fagerdalsfjall, the volcanic system that erupted. And I had to walk straight up the mountain uh, in muddy conditions. So my shoes were just sinking away in the, in the mud on the mountainsides. But then when I got to the top and I could finally see the eruption, this was just unbelievable. To me, this felt like 
I was a kid that entered into a toy store and I was just like, wow, what, what is this? Like, what's happening? And when I got like over this initial moment, I hiked down the mountain or almost ran down the mountain and I got to the, the flowing lava and started photographing. And over the years, I had kind of prepared a mental list uh, of shots I wanted to make. I looked at other people's work uh, at other volcanoes and I kind of decided, okay, this is what I want to uh, photograph. So I started running down the list and I was running around a little bit like uh, no clue what I was doing, but I had this list that was keeping me like grounded which is probably why I came back with so many really nice photos and this first moment was just unbelievable just the idea that I was standing about 30 meters away from a conduit where lava is flowing out is pouring out and this really left a really big impression on me and yeah here are some of the shots that I made on that very first day The second moment I want to talk about is when a new fissure opened about two weeks after the eruption began. At this time, there are two craters that had formed during the initial eruption. Their flow had decreased quite a bit and suddenly around noon on the same day when the flow decreased, a crack opened towards the north. Immediately authorities uh, decided to close the area, which was really smart because we didn't really know what was going to happen next and exactly the unexpected happened and more cracks opened parallel to the new one that had formed and only three days later were we allowed back into the area so i decided to go back into the area on the very first day we were back allowed um, i first hiked up to the lava field and then i decided to go along the eastern side and we managed to get a few photos uh, in the beginning, but soon after we arrived, the wind shifted and all the gas came flying at us. So we had to get out of this area. When we went back to the southern side, um, when we did, I was like, I didn't want to go home because I had waited for three days to get back to this area. I was finally there. So I was gonna try and find another way to get there. So we started walking along the western side and along the western side, uh, it was a lot more hilly. It was, you had to go up and down quite a lot. And uh, while we were walking, fog was rolling into the area. It was a really special moment in the sense that you could hear all the lava coming up out of the craters, but you couldn't really see them. You could only see the light radiating from the lava, but we knew where to go. And as soon as we got to the newest northernmost crater, the most unimaginable and most special thing happened. Uh, I will never forget this moment. Um, we got to the lava field and the crater uh, had lava flowing out of it, but it was going to the eastern side of the crater. And while we were there, the flow shifted from the crater and it started coming at us on the western side. And this was crazy 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 i just took my backpack put it back on my back and uh, the lava was just coming at us it was slowly or slowly quite fast for lava it was moving 
at about uh, a meter every two, three seconds, I would say. And I was just taking my wide angle, getting up as close as I could and taking really wide photos and also filming the movement of it because the speed of it was just unlike anything that I had ever seen. And this was an incredible moment. And especially when you realize that we were only 15 people there. There were two people from a search and rescue who were also there. But we were 15 just normal people checking out the eruption, photographing it. And this was unbelievable. I have, yeah, after that moment, I had not seen anything like this again. And this is why it easily gets number two on my list. So the third moment I want to talk about is something that was a little bit of a chase or a hunt that I had in the beginning phases of the eruption. And from the beginning, as we got to the end of the Northern Lights season, I was kind of wondering, would it be possible to photograph the Northern Lights above the eruption? And first of all, it's not an easy thing uh, to photograph because it's technically very difficult as you generally use a longer shutter speed to photograph the northern lights but the lava is emitting so much light that you kind of need a short shutter speed so for that purpose you need quite strong northern lights and you need a lot of things to align you need first of all you need the northern lights you need the darkness which was getting much shorter at that time the days were getting much longer you need nice weather and you need of course an, an active eruption which we had um, one particular evening uh, in the middle of April, uh, when the nights were getting very short, but there was still a chance to get this experience, I set out with a friend to go to the eruption. And this particular evening was kind of crazy. We had all kinds of weather thrown at us. Uh, we had hail, we had snow, we had brutal and harsh winds. Uh, and it was really difficult, like every five minutes everything would change, which is something that's really typical for Icelandic weather. And around 10 p.m. The, we just got so cold, so we decided to call it a day and just go back to the car park. But as we were heading back, the sky started clearing up and I just kept looking up and I was just hoping that something would happen. And when we were about halfway down, I noticed that there was a really faint grey cloud overhead and uh, for anyone who has photographed the Northern Lights before you know that when you see this uh, above you you know that there's probably so much activity you can kind of expect something more to happen and when uh, I saw this we decided to get off the path and uh, get away uh, from like where other people were and we sat up behind some rocks and just started looking and I had set up my camera looking at the eruption and angled it so that the sky would be in the shot and sure enough an hour later the northern lights started dancing above our heads and at this time I was like oh my god now we are really 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 getting close to this elusive shot and as uh, the northern lights started dancing they started moving further and further towards the north and for about 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds, the northern lights were right above the eruption. So I could, with my 16 millimeters, frame them in one shot. And uh, I got a shot and I was just ecstatic, like especially because my goal was to uh, get the real thing. I wanted to make the real photograph and not composite it together from 
other shots that I had made, but also I wanted to do it in one shot. I didn't want to do uh, an HDR photograph, which probably would have been a lot easier technically, but I felt like I just needed this challenge. I needed this challenge to uh, get creative in how I would solve this, this problem. And when I got the shot, I was just over the moon. And after we got the shot, we started hiking down. And as we hiked down, the Northern Lights were dancing above our heads even stronger than before. And I just felt saturated. I just felt like, okay, I, I have this photograph and uh, no other photograph is going to be better to me because of this special moment. Like maybe it was, could have been a technical better photograph, but to me it was all about the moment and the story behind this photograph. The fourth moment I want to talk about is not really a moment, it's more of a, a period of time during the eruption where I felt like I needed to get more creative with my photography. And this was when all the creators had kind of shut down one by one and only one creator remained active. And this creator then started growing and it grew and grew and grew up until it became a mountain. And that's one of the things that really uh, stuck with me during this eruption is that I saw the start of the eruption. I saw an empty valley with a teeny tiny cone in it. And then now when you go there, there is an actual mountain. It's more than 350 meters high above where it used to be erupting. So that's something that was really unique to me. This uh, fact that I saw a mountain quite literally being born in, fr in front of my eyes. I saw it grow, grow up, sort of. Uh, but the thing that really struck me was when this single cone was active, I needed to find new ways to get different kinds of shots. So I started walking around the area and I started finding new angles where most people were not going. For example, uh, most people were going to a place called Cone Holt which is a, a viewing hill that was uh, really close to the crater. And you could get really nice shots there, like don't get me wrong, but I wanted to get more than just those additional shots. So I decided to uh, get around to the western side of a lava field and I started flying my drone in, in uh, certain places I hadn't been before. Um, I also started incorporating people into my uh, shots, not like a subject, but as a way to show the scale, because it was really difficult to show scale. Um, these are some of the photographs that I was able to take, uh, that I will show you now. And these were taken over a period of time of maybe six to seven weeks. So every visit that I made, I was focusing on a different area with a different goal in mind. And that's why all these shots are uh, going to be looking so different.
fifth and final moment I want to talk about today is a little bit of a strange moment. At the end of the eruption, the eruption actually shut down for about 10 or 11 days. And we were all kind of under the impression that the eruption just had stopped and that it was over. And then, to everyone's surprise, suddenly the activity starts picking up in the morning uh, on a Saturday. And I remember this moment really well because I was guiding a group of people to the eruption just a couple of days before and they were of course really disappointed that there wasn't any uh, visible activity anymore. But then, because they were still in Iceland, I could give them a call and we could just go up there. And by the evening, the activity had picked up a lot and the valley surrounding the crater had filled up completely with new lava. And what was really interesting was that in certain areas, uh, kind of a, a secondary vents were created. They were not real vents coming from down the fissure, but they were tubes that were linked to this fissure, but extended away from the main fissure. And this created a really cool effect. Uh, some of these vents, they were kind of like fountains bubbling up in certain areas. And they created these really cool spirals, uh, which you could only see by drone. And I managed to get some, some fun video and some fun photos of it. But what was really unique also was that the crater, it had split open on the side. So it had completely cracked open because the main conduit was blocked. And this whole evening was kind of, yeah, this was just unbelievable. Uh, this was, the, to me, this was like the volcano was giving it uh, an extra push before it finally stopped. It stopped about seven days later. And the days that followed to this moment were really incredible because the whole valley had filled up with new lava. There was a really big lava river flowing in the middle of the old Geltingadalir. And it was, yeah, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. Even, even before that moment, I had seen so many unique moments during this eruption. This was something that was even more special. And I took a lot of photos during that time, and I will show a couple of you now. So that's it for my five moments and experiences during this eruption in Geltingatalir. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you are interested in hearing a lot more about this and hearing a lot more of my stories and experiences, uh, I have a book out that I wrote and self-published. It's called New Earth. It's available on my own website, but you can also buy it when you're traveling to Iceland in different bookstores around the country and also some souvenir stores. Um, I also have an ebook out which is an ebook about some of my favorite photography locations in Iceland. I don't only share the locations but I also explain to you how to get there, uh, how to behave in certain areas because some of these areas uh, are very fragile and I also share how I would approach them from a photographic view. So uh, yeah I recommend you check it out it's also available on my website. I also have a bunch of workshops, some of which are sold out, some of which aren't. And you can also see those on my website. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. Uh, it would really mean the world to me. And you can also share and like the video. And if you didn't like it, you can also dislike the video. Uh, so yeah, that was it. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.